Hi everyone, Peter here from Flow High Performance, and in this video, we will be covering all about strength and conditioning for goalkeepers, from the annual plan to the details of the microcycle. Before we can create a strength and conditioning program for goalkeepers, we first need to have a look at what athletic movements they are trying to enhance. Goalkeepers require short distance sprints, usually from a stationary start, to burst off their line and chase the ball. Another attribute required by goalkeepers is agility. They need to be able to quickly change direction in response to the run of the gameplay. Goalkeepers also need to be able to explosively leap vertically, forward and laterally from both stationary and moving positions. And lastly, goalkeepers are sometimes required to repeat a combination of these explosive movements with no recovery. For example, if they need to make a double save or make a save then quickly return back to their goal. Therefore, goalkeepers may also require some specific endurance work. Now that we understand the general physical requirements of goalkeepers, we now need to establish what training qualities can be beneficial to enhance these physical attributes for goalkeepers. The first method of training that can benefit goalkeepers is unloaded sprint training. This refers to linear sprinting with no additional resistance. Unloaded sprints can benefit goalkeepers by improving their acceleration over short distances. Unloaded sprints don't need to be more than 20 meters in length since goalkeepers will very rarely sprint longer than this in a straight line and will almost never reach top speed. The next quality is resisted sprint training. This refers to sprinting using some form of external load, such as running up a hill or pulling a sled. Resisted sprints have the primary benefit of overloading the force requirements of sprinting. This generally has positive transfer to acceleration performance, which is important for goalkeepers. Next, we have change of direction training. Change of direction refers to the ability to rapidly decelerate and then accelerate in a different direction. If goalkeepers can become faster at changing direction, they can more quickly turn and chase the ball or get themselves back into the required position. The next quality that can benefit goalkeepers is plyometric training. Plyometrics refer to the exercises which have a high reliance on the stretch shortening cycle. By using plyometrics in a training program, we can become more efficient at using the stretch shortening cycle and can more effectively use the elastic properties of the tendons. This can benefit physical performance of goalkeepers during fast velocity movements such as short sprints and jumping from a moving position. The next quality for goalkeepers is power training. This refers to ballistic exercises using an external load such as loaded jumps and throws. Power training can enhance the amount of force that can be produced in short periods of time. This can have a positive effect on jumping ability and acceleration sprint performance. Next up, we have maximal strength. Maximal strength refers to training to enhance absolute force production. This has benefit to every other training quality by increasing the absolute ceiling of force output. This will then enhance force production in shorter time frames if other training methods are performed simultaneously. General strength training refers to full body resistance training with moderate loads in the 6 to 15 rep range. General strength training provides two primary benefits for athletes. First, it provides hypertrophy adaptations to build a baseline of muscle mass. Second, it makes athletes more robust and reduces injury rates. And the last quality that can be beneficial for goalkeepers is endurance training. This refers to the ability to repeat performance. For goalkeepers specifically, endurance is the ability to repeat short bursts of high intensity sprinting, changing direction and jumping with no recovery. While all these qualities are beneficial for goalkeepers, not all qualities need to be trained directly in a strength and conditioning training session. This is because some qualities will already be trained in goalkeeper practice, making it unnecessary to dedicate additional time to training a quality that is already being trained very frequently. Change of direction ability and goalkeeper specific endurance will already be trained during practice sessions and don't need to be included in strength and conditioning sessions. Therefore, only unloaded sprints, resisted sprints, plyometrics, power training, max strength and general strength need to be targeted in SNC sessions. 
Now that we know exactly which qualities will be trained in our strength and conditioning sessions, we need to establish a rough idea of how these can be periodized over time. When periodizing training qualities, we want to use a more general emphasis further from when the athlete needs to be in peak condition and a more specific emphasis closer to their peak. We will now cover how each quality can be periodized from general to specific. Unloaded sprint training can be periodized by starting with shorter distance sprints and gradually building up to longer distances. This is necessary to acclimate the athlete to the demands of high velocity sprinting. Resisted sprint training can be periodized by using heavier loads and shorter distance further from the athlete's peak to lighter loads with longer distances closer to their peak. This will emphasize force production first and allow faster running velocities later. This will emphasize force production early in the periodized plan, which can then potentiate faster velocity resisted sprinting. Plyometric training can be periodized by using exercises with longer contact times further from the goalkeeper's peak and exercises with shorter ground contact times closer to their peak. Shorter contact times are more specific to athletic movements and will have higher transfer to athletic performance. Longer contact times will emphasize force production and could potentiate more specific plyometrics. Power training can be periodized by using heavier loads further from the athlete's peak and lighter loads closer to their peak. This will involve higher forces and slower velocities initially, followed by high velocities with force required to be produced in faster times. Since athletic movements generally require force to be produced in short time frames, lighter loads will probably have higher transfer to performance, while heavier loads can be used to potentiate lighter loads. Maximal strength training can be periodized by using higher rep ranges with lighter loads further from the athlete's peak and lower rep ranges with heavier loads closer to their peak. This will allow muscle hypertrophy to be emphasized initially and maximal force output to be emphasized later. Since force is ultimately what allows humans to perform athletic movements, training to maximize force output would likely have the highest transfer to performance, while muscle growth will potentiate maximal force output. General strength training doesn't necessarily need to be periodized as the goal for this form of training is simply to provide general structural adaptations. Athletes should still apply progressive overload by performing more reps and more weight in the 6 to 15 rep range over time, although no specific periodization model is required. Now that we have established what training qualities can be beneficial for goalkeepers and how these can be periodized, let's now explore how these qualities fit into the annual plan. The first and most important component of the annual plan is the competition schedule. This is a rough outline of when the competitive matches will be for the preseason, regular season, and even cup games. The competition schedule determines the rest of the annual plan as training will be planned to have the athlete in peak condition for these competitive matches. As we can see in this example, yellow boxes have been used to indicate competitive matches. The light yellow boxes are preseason friendly games and the darker yellow boxes are competitive matches of the regular season or cup games. As we can see here, the regular season runs from around mid-August to mid-March. Based on this competition schedule, we can break the year up into the off-season, pre-season and in-season periods. For this example, the in-season period runs from the first competitive match to the last. Then the players are given a seven-week off-season after the end of the season to recover mentally and physically from the tough season. Then, the pre-season runs for 15 weeks before the first competitive match. We can now split the year up into training blocks, which essentially act as mesocycles. As we can see here, we have split the year up into five week mesocycles to make planning training easier for the strength and conditioning coach. The pre-season has three blocks and the in-season has six blocks. The off-season hasn't been broken down into blocks as the players won't be doing any formal training with the team. Now we can roughly plan the emphasis of each training quality throughout the year. As we can see here, the pre-season uses more general training methods to build a solid foundation when the keeper doesn't need to be in absolute peak condition. Then as the season gets closer, more specific training methods are used. At around midway during the season, a short block of more general training is implemented again to ensure the athletes don't lose their baseline fitness levels. 
and then the most specific training methods are implemented towards the end of the season to have the keeper in peak physical condition. And lastly, we have the peaking index. The peaking index is a rough guide to when we expect the athlete to be in what condition. As we can see here, a simple number system has been implemented to indicate the athlete's condition. A lower number means better physical condition and a higher number means a worse condition. As we can see in this annual plan, the goalkeeper is expected to be in better condition on average during the season and worse condition during the off season and preseason, based on how the qualities have been periodized. Now that we've created an annual plan, let's now explore how to plan a mesocycle of training. Before getting into the programming details, we first need to establish the mesocycle structure. We will use a five week mesocycle structure for this example, as it fits with the annual plan that we created. With this five week mesocycle, the first week will be a deload and the following four weeks will be overloading training. This means that the first week will be lower in volume to reduce accumulated fatigue from the previous mesocycle, while the other four weeks will use enough volume to stimulate adaptations. Now that we have a basic mesocycle structure in place, let's explore how each quality can be emphasized. The emphasis of each quality will change based on the time of year. The annual plan outlines which qualities will be trained to keep us on track at all times. Let's now cover how training may look for mesocycles at different times of the year. First, let's establish what a mesocycle may look like in an early preparation period. This is when the athlete doesn't need to be in peak condition, so the most general training methods are used. As we can see here, unloaded sprints use shorter distances, resisted sprints use heavier loads with shorter distances, plyometric training uses longer contact times, power training uses heavy loads, maximal strength uses higher rep ranges, and general strength doesn't have any specific emphasis. Next, let's cover what a mesocycle may look like later in the preparation period, but not when the athlete needs to be in absolute peak condition. Here, more specific training methods should be used but not the most specific. As we can see here, unloaded sprints use moderate distances, resisted sprints use moderate loads with moderate distances, plyometric training uses moderate ground contact times, power training uses moderate loads, maximal strength uses moderate rep ranges, and general strength doesn't have a specific emphasis. Now let's cover what a mesocycle may look like when the goalkeeper needs to be in absolute peak condition. Here the most specific training method should be used for maximal transfer to athletic performance. As we can see here, unloaded sprints use longer distances, resisted sprints use longer distances with lighter loads, plyometrics use short contact times, power training uses lighter loads, maximal strength uses lower rep ranges, and general strength has no specific emphasis. And the last component to creating a strength and conditioning program for soccer goalkeepers is creating the microcycle. The microcycle refers to the shortest repeatable training cycle that an athlete performs. This is usually a week of training to align conveniently with the calendar. Before planning the details of the strength and conditioning microcycle, we first need to establish when the athlete has soccer practice and what days they will perform separate strength and conditioning sessions. For this example, let's say the athlete has soccer practice on Tuesdays and Thursdays and has matches on Sundays. Now that we know the soccer practice schedule, we need to plan when strength and conditioning sessions will be performed. However, we first need to establish where the sessions will be performed. Let's say for this example, unloaded sprints, resisted sprints and plyometrics will be performed before the two team soccer practice sessions on the field, while power, maximal strength and general strength training will be performed twice per week in the gym on Wednesdays and Fridays. Next, we can select exercises for each training session. For the field sessions, we have chosen straight sprints for both days as an unloaded sprint exercise. For resisted sprints, we have chosen the sled pull as we can easily adjust the load to change the emphasis. And for plyometric training, we have implemented bounds as an exercise. For the gym sessions, we have chosen the trap bar jump as a power exercise. For maximal strength, we have chosen the back squat as the main lift, and for general strength training, we have chosen the dumbbell bench press, stiff leg deadlift, military press, and pull-ups to target the rest of the body. And finally, we can program the details of the microcycle. Let's go through three example microcycles for different times of the year. A week of training in the early preparation period may look something like this. 
As we can see here, the unloaded sprints and sled pulls use a short distance of 10 meters. The sled pull also uses a heavy load to emphasize force production. And the bounds use an additional 10 kilos in the form of a weight vest to make ground contact times longer. For the gym sessions, the trap bar jump uses a heavy load, the back squat uses a higher rep range of six to eight, and the general strength exercises all use a rep range of eight to 12. A week of training later in the year may look something like this. As we can see here, the unloaded sprints use a slightly longer distance of 15 meters. The sled pull also uses a distance of 15 meters and a moderate load. And the bounds use a five kilo weight vest. For the gym sessions, the trap bar jump uses a moderate load, the back squat uses a moderate rep range of three to five, and the general strength exercises remain the same. A week of training when the goalkeeper needs to be in peak condition may look something like this. As we can see here, the unloaded sprints use a distance of 20 meters, the sled pull uses a distance of 20 meters with light loads, and the bounds use no additional load. For the gym sessions, the trap bar jump uses a light load, the back squat uses a low rep range of one to three, and the general strength exercises remain the same once again. Thanks for watching and hopefully you got something out of this video. Remember to subscribe if you haven't already.